we have a power that remains elusive and remains out of sight because we constantly are engaging in that great deception by chasing the Holy Grail and uh, really are robbed from the innate power that we possess, actually, that innate power that we have been given by nature, by, by birth. The history really starts and is based on the teachings of two very prominent people. One of them, a quantum physicist called David Bohm, B-O-H-M, and the other one, a philosopher, um, kind of, I would just call him a guru uh, or a uh, light blazer called uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, one of uh, Indian descent. This is a very interesting factual history, and you can look it up, David Bohm, Society and Jiddu Krishnamurti or Krishnamurti Foundation America. You can go to these sources and find out more information. But the gist of it really comes down to a couple of quick synopsis or summaries. David Ohm, being a quantum physicist, he tapped into what is now generally known as the observer observed effect. That the, the very phenomena that we observe, they actually impact the observation itself. They impact the realities around them. Well, when we discuss the observer and the observer being separate, see, with a space between them, that's in the image, right? Now, that would imply that there would be time to act on the... See, it would take some time to cross the space, and there would be enough independence of the observer so that he could think about it a little while and then do something, right? Do you see? Having that space and time. Hmm? But if that is just simply an image, not... And in fact, it's all one thought process. The observe, whatever you call the observer, has already been affected by the thing he wants to observe. Namely, he wants to observe anger. He's already been affected by anger in a distorted way, right? Mm. So, uh, so far, it has been an elusive chase for quantum physicists actually to observe the reality because they're by their very observation, they're changing the reality that they are actually observing. So it becomes this never-ending cycle of chasing what is truth that remains elusive. Ultimately, the core uh, phenomenon or uh, dilemma and issue is, has come to be known as the observer-observed phenomenon, if you will, and the relationship between these. Now, David Bohm got notice of uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti very much because Jiddu Krishnamurti too uh, came up with this uh, puzzle, like it was in his teachings, it was pointing toward that, that they're due to this reality of almost duality uh, of the observer and observed uh, state of mind within ourselves as individual human beings, we also are dealing with a specific dilemma that leads to that deception of thought or at least a recognition of the power of the deception of thought. So this is how they met each other back in the 50s, 1950s, and they started working together and basically gave lectures together and so forth. However, ultimately, uh, the importance of Krishnamurti's teaching and recognition of this difference between observe and observe boils down to uh, the fact that as we are capable of observing ourselves and created this almost illusion of two different states of being, we tend to disconnect internally. We tend to think there are actually two different beings, whereas that is a fallacy. There are no two different beings in us. We are one and the same. Now, uh, in modern t psychology, we call that metacognition, the ability to kind of think about what we are thinking, observe what we are uh, noticing about ourselves, have that self-reflection and self-examination. However, the, there is a, a deeper truth to what Krishnamurti was bringing up in regards to, well, that is fine, that's nice, that's good. However, there, it comes with certain um, damages, which comes with certain cons, with certain disadvantages that we are not paying attention to. When we internally are very much subconsciously disconnected between these two aspects of ourselves, 
we tend to lean towards possible, possibly make certain decisions, take certain actions, or simply remain preoccupied with certain ways of uh, experiencing the world that tend to lead to certain disadvantages and damages in our lives, such as, let's say, the preoccupation with the past. When we allow our thoughts that are coming up in us, in that space between the observant and observed, founded on the uh, uh, phenomenon of disconnection, to hijack us from the moment into the past, we become preoccupied with what has been happening in the past, specifically what has been lost in the past. We become preoccupied with regret, with depression, with sadness, with kind of a reflection of all the opportunities that we are kind of lost. And contrary to it, also when we become a, a kind of preoccupied with certain fears about what hasn't come, with probabilities that have not occurred, then we also get hijacked away from the moment into these unnecessary anxieties, worries, etc., that just are future-oriented and oriented toward prevention of the worst from happening. Now, as a result, we have a lot of pathologies that are associated with that, major depression being one of them, as well as paranoia. Now, that comes from that state of being disconnected from our own sense of self from being in the moment. Krishnamurti goes even further, same thing with Bohm. They have suggested that a lot of our societal problems and chaos and disorders are also associated with that because when we are actually internally disconnected and dissociated from our own self, uh, there's no wonder that we are also disconnected from everybody else, from people around us and allow again uh, our thoughts to hijack our connectedness to our humankind, to other people, and simply uh, we are able to categorize, pigeonhole different groups of people into different uh, segments, sections of the society, and then become quite oblivious, uh, distant, and uh, convince ourselves that uh, you know, it has nothing to do with us. Uh, convince ourselves that we just need to act as individuals rather than as collective organisms, entities who exist in this world and are always connected to one another. That remains another story, another philosophy to discuss whether or not that is the case. I leave it up to you. But uh, Krishnamurti and Bohm were very much uh, uh, suggesting that if we can uh, collect our our uh, beings, uh, if we can collect our powers, if we can collect our uh, connectedness, we can fight against that type of a disconnection in society that leads to discrimination, to this leads to uh, wars, to uh, atrocities, and so forth. However, what I want to do in these uh, uh, videos and in this series is to get everybody's attention to the fact that we have a power that we remains elusive and remains out of sight because we constantly are engaging in that great deception by chasing the Holy Grail and uh, really are robbed from the innate power that we possess, actually, that innate power that we have been given by nature, by, by birth, by simply existing in this world and uh, constantly being distracted from that power. I want everyone to be able to regain that power. It's gonna be, a, uh, to some extent, a difficult task, but once you actually put the effort and recognize how to shift away from just thinking and being preoccupied and deceived and hijacked by thoughts into simply being, you will recognize that power that is immense, immeasurable, uh, absolutely fantastic, and uh, for sure leads to true happiness. Now, let me give you a couple of analogies for you to see how that can work out. One analogy is from the animal world, actually. But it's a good analogy because we can observe it, we can see it for ourselves in action. The other analogy is from the lives of people who do exemplify that Zen-like being. And I'm gonna share those analogies with you. Number one, from the 
animal world, very much when we observe our pets, especially dogs. You notice that dogs can actually teach us a lot simply by their way of being in and at times of peace and danger. You observe that if you have a pet, you have, or even I've seen other people's pets, you have seen how specifically dogs' reactions to threat, prior to threat, during the threat, and after the threat is just mind-boggling. You see that they are, they, you may, we may see, for instance, let's say a dog lying around at home in an apartment, in a house, etc., just completely at ease, at peace. However, they get activated when there is a threat, uh, whether it is real threat or not. Sometimes we see dogs kind of bark at the mailman. That's not a real threat to them, at least, but they don't see it in action. They still observe it and subjectively perceive it as threat. So regardless of that, and in fact, that is a very important a distinction in regards to understanding trauma too, that even for human beings, it doesn't matter whether the threat is objective or not, even subjectively experienced threat is good enough to qualify for a traumatic event, a traumatic experience. So long story short, this dog was, uh, that um, experiences that threat does what? They jump to the occasion. They take action immediately, protect themselves, protect the environment take care of the threat in the framework that they know best of, which would be protection. And once the threat is gone, let's say that mailman walks away or maybe an intruder who tried to break into the home, uh, hears the dog and walks away, what does the dog do? Does it uh, start ruminating about what should have been, could have been, would have been? Does it constantly worry about, oh, the intruder may come back? Does it just kind of get down and depressed and says, eh, the past hasn't worked, I have been robbed, I have been hit, I have been abused or whatnot, I'm not gonna chase this threat? No, once it is over, they reorient themselves to the present moment, just like they reoriented themselves away from a peaceful sleep into fighting the threat or protecting their environment, they reoriented themselves back to what is which is absence of threat, and they calm down. Human beings have been taught not to act this way anymore. Since birth, if you look at infants, you notice that they always live in the present moment. They're not worried about the past or ruminating about the past. They're, they don't have any, any notion of the future and don't ruminate about it either. And what we do generally, we start to actually infuse these types of threats concerns into their thinking by teaching them how to think about the past and think about the future. Again, that is why I call it that we have been kind of robbed from this uh, ability and opportunity. We actually innately, all of us are capable of reorientation to the present because we have been born with it. However, we have been reprogrammed to kind of let go and be and remain kind of buy in to the false necessity of constantly uh, being stuck in the past or chasing the future. This was an analogy from the um, animal world. Another similar analogy is from people who are have kind of made it, if you will, not necessarily just financially. There can be artists who are not financially financially well. Um, you know, um, uh, gurus again. Uh, uh, people who are great at meditation, for sure. Uh, maybe even poets, philosophers, writers, uh, dancers. And uh, many times you see the common denominator here is art, because it has a very, very special uh, place and uh, power in helping people to actually reorient themselves to the present moment. Any of those artists, they will have to switch to a different way of existing, which is being being in the moment in order to perform their artistic creativity. Otherwise, they cannot even do that. An author cannot write if they're not in the moment, a writer. Uh, a painter cannot paint if they're not focused in the moment, in the beauty of the uh, whatever imagination it ha they have at the moment. A poet cannot write a poet, poem without being in the moment. And a dancer cannot perform very well with their whole body if they're not in the moment. That's the common denominator. But uh, even people who are not 
necessarily artistic in that fashion, but have made it to a point where they uh, exude at least a Zen-like being, and they could be very, you know, uh, uh, successful business professionals too. Uh, you see what they do? They have that commonality with that, basically the nature, the, the, the programmatic nature that all organisms generally are uh, bestowed with, which is when it comes to loss, people who uh, exude that Zen-like type of an attitude in life, they're not that impacted by loss. They, they don't see loss like, like we see loss, like generally people, other people see loss. Let me give you a tangible example. A busy professional who misses an, uh, their, their flight. The one who is, are in the Zen-like presence, they just say, they accept it. They accept it that they missed the flight, they take the next flight. They rearrange, they reorient themselves to what is, not what could have been, should have been, would have been. They don't ruminate about what has been lost because mostly all the rumination with the past revolves around loss, not much else. Also, they're not that worried about the future like most other people are. Not because how much money they have or how many people work for them or what kind of a uh, lifestyle they occupy. No, because it is that Zen-like moment that has taught them, you know, you got to deal with what's in front of you. That's what you got to deal with. And so they have been somehow trained or tra trained themselves to espouse that type of a Zen-like attitude. That's more an analogy from even a business world that some of you can uh, relate to. I hope that these two analogies have been helpful to at least get your attention toward what we are talking about, what we, what I would like to uh, pass on to you as a viewer, to see where the direction is that we need to go and what you can expect from this channel. Thank you for watching. Tune in to the other videos that are going to uh, come along and let me know what you think by posting some comments. Thank you.